So I want to welcome you all to presentation training. What do investors really want to hear? And it's, it's fascinating because they do want to hear your passion and they want to see that come through, but they also want to hear other items, uh, which is not necessarily aligned with why the entrepreneur starts the business. My name is Brandon McDonald. I am the president for Credit Forum Northwest. I joined the organization in 2005 and have been investing in companies, leading due diligence, and participating in the organization since that time. I joined on as president in 2018 and have been uh, leading the Northwest region uh, for the last few years now. Uh, it's been fun. There's never a dull moment. Something always fun and exciting to be looking at. And I love being on the cutting edge of, edge of innovation. I've seen hundreds of pitches. I've also uh, started and failed my own company as well. Uh, it didn't cost me too much money. And it was a great learning experience. So I take some of that, uh, those lessons learned, and I also share them with you. So I've been on both sides of the table, and it's definitely different. Um, from whatever perspective that you're sitting in. And who are we at Caretsu Forum? We are the largest angel network globally. Uh, we have over 3,000 members. It's actually four continents, over 50 chapters. And since COVID hit, we've now been able to work together a lot close, more closely than we were before because we are not limited by our geography and where we are, are located. Uh, so I run the Northwest region. We have chapters all over the world. We syndicate our deal flow. It helps to make sure that our entrepreneurs that we're serving are able to raise the capital that they need to raise and get back to doing what they do best, which is running their company. So what do we fund? Uh, we, we fund something very specific and understanding the ecosystem, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit, is extremely important. Knowing where you go at what time and being strategic about that. Uh, there's different funders at different stages and different investors that have different theses. And so how do you figure that all out? Well, you can start looking at groups and they'll usually be pretty transparent as to what they fund, whether it be pre-seed or seed. Uh, for us, we really, um, our sweet spot is minimum you're raising about 500,000, up to five or even 10 million. Uh, we do a lot of later stage funding. We have family offices that we leverage and work with for, for some of those later deals that are coming through. But we fill this funding gap. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as you, you know, think about your fundraising strategy and what that's going to be for you and, and what the goals um, you're looking to achieve for your business in that fundraising is that the marketplace has changed dramatically over the last uh, 10 years. And there's really different routes you can take. So there is VC funding, uh, and that is definitely a different route, uh, we believe now that you can take versus the private capital route, which is more the route that we work in. One item, uh, and this data is a little bit old, but uh, do want to point you to it because I think it's fascinating and it is still pretty true today, is 23 billion went into 66,000 deals in 2018 and 130 billion went into just under nine. So if you look at the competitive nature, what you're looking to accomplish, what the goals of those investors are, and how they impact you and how you run your company, these are important things to think about as you develop your fundraising strategy, what's going to work for you, and what type of ownership are you looking to give up uh, within your company as you continue to go through your, um, your stages. So we uh, have been number one the last five years. Uh, we were, they just launched, announced our data a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we're number one again in North America in uh, early stage and late stage funding, which is exciting to see uh, that we've been on top, but we do fund uh, a great amount of deals here. And globally, uh, last year, or in 2019, yeah, in 2019, we were number two in early stage globally and number one in late stage. Uh, in 2020, we were number four uh, in early stage and number one in late stage globally. So it's exciting to see that we are sitting up on this list with very uh, many reputable firms and we're excited to be supporting entrepreneurs in their fundraising journey. In 2019, our data worked out uh, as such in terms of life science and technology. We really do sit on the cutting edge of innovation and that's what our, a lot of our investors like to focus on. That said, we look at a, a wide variety of deals uh, and it really depends on the team, who makes up the team, their execution plan, their traction, uh, and where they're at in the growth cycle of their company. So we do look at clean tech, even real estate, 
to help balance out the portfolio. In 2019, our investors put 54 million into 83 companies. In 2020, our investors put in 59 million into 67 companies. So we had a very active year last year, uh, despite us being able to see less deals come through our pipeline due to the new Zoom format. Uh, we have our investment process. It's strict. Uh, it's strict for a reason. A lot of the reasons why this is the way it is, is to really help you be able to cultivate relationships with the investors. It's really important to know who's investing in your company. People do business with people they know and trust. And I say this often. Uh, so it starts off with committee review, uh, whether that be through the life science or the technology committee. And then uh, from there, you're either invited to move forward to the next stage or might be delayed or maybe not a good fit. We provide resources uh, for you. Uh, at deal screening, it's the same. Uh, we have about 60 members that sit in on deal screening now, and they choose to invite the companies forward into our forum process. Uh, so that happens once a month at six meetings uh, that people, uh, that the entrepreneurs pitch uh, to with about 300 investors at minimum. Uh, that is our goal every month to reach throughout the six meetings. And gather interest and from there move on to due diligence, uh, which is a more of a deep dive. We have a more robust due diligence process than most, but as you prepare yourself to continue to grow and move into later stages of your company, uh, that due diligence gets more and more rigorous. So we really help prep you uh, up front for some of that rigor uh, that's about to occur and make it easier along the way. So it does take time to move through the process. That said, uh, there's a lot of value that can be made along the way, and that's also how relationships are built. So um, if we could launch the poll quickly, um, and we're going to launch a quick poll on just you know what you're looking for uh, today, what you're looking for from Koretsu Forum, how we can support and help in any way. So if you want to fill that out, it'll just help us be able to follow up uh, appropriately. Uh, in creating a fundable pitch, I just want to say your pitch isn't what raises you capital. Uh, the pitch gathers interest. And that interest, then you're able to go out, you're able to talk to individuals, get to know them and build relationships. So keep that in mind. So much of what we do when we go out and fundraise, it has to do with our mental game and how we're preparing ourselves. And when I had my company, it was really daunting. Oh, I got to go pitch. And from this pitch, I need to raise a million dollars. And how am I going to do that? Uh, it's daunting. You feel like you're looking up a tall mountain that you need to start climbing. But if you're able to break it down mentally in little goals that are achievable, it makes it so much easier and rewarding at the same time. So keeping in mind, it's just interest. How many, how many indications of interest would you like to get from the meeting that you're pitching at? Is it eight? Is it 10? Would you like to get those phone calls? And then from there, you know, start the process. Because once you start talking about what you do and how it works and being able to have that time that isn't constrained by your pitch to uh, be able to go into the detail that you want to, it's going to make it so much easier. So just a perspective shift uh, to keep in mind as you, as you go out into this journey. All right, so the first thing I wanna start with is knowing your audience. I cannot stress this enough. Um, first, this is not charity. Uh, we are investors. Investors are individuals or an organization that puts money into financial plans, property, et cetera, with the expectation of receiving a profit. So a lot of what I find sometimes is that like, well, invest in me and I'm not gonna tell you how you're gonna make your money back. Well, that, that doesn't work very well. So know your audience. Also understanding there's different funders at different stages. So is it pre-seed, is it seed? I am getting cold blasted emails on a daily basis through my LinkedIn, through my email account, you know, I'm fundraising this, I'm fundraising that, I'm pre-seed. It is so much noise. I, it doesn't work. Be more strategic. Know your audience, know your investors, know who you want to target, and be authentic uh, about that uh, instead, of, instead of just cold blasting uh, as many investors as you can. It really, it doesn't look good, and it comes off as being desperate. And no investor actually wants to put a money into a company that looks like they're desperate for cash because they're probably going to end up losing their money. Next. What's your purpose? 
What's your passion? Now, this comes through in multiple ways. Even on Zoom, this comes through. So it doesn't actually have to do a lot with your slides. It has to do, you talk about things, the inflection in your voice, that, that language that occurs that is not written. It is all the body language uh, or spoken. So just keep that in mind. It comes through in ways. And, and seeing your passion and drive, this is what keeps you up late at night. This is what gets you up early in the morning. And this is going to really be your gasoline in your tank that helps take you the distance. And the investors can then know that you're the right person to steer the ship and lead this company to success. The second thing you're going to want to do in your pitch is eliminate red flags. Red flags and confusion. I will cue you in. We are all looking for red flags and confusion. There is so much deal flow out there right now. And being able to see which is good and which is not, we are all looking for reasons not to invest. Also, the people you're pitching to have probably lost money before investing in opportunities. So we're looking for those little places we can poke holes in the things. Uh, so eliminate red flags and confusion. Call out the elephant in the room. We know your pitch isn't perfect. We know your company isn't perfect. Uh, you wouldn't be in the early stages if it was. You would be on the public markets and worth a billion dollars if everything was aligned properly. So just keep that in mind. Don't give the investors an opportunity to give you a gotcha question. Uh, and if you don't know the answer to something, that's fine. Don't know the answer. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, eliminate red flags, and I'll go through that uh, through the course of the presentation. Next, demonstrate competency. Now, this can be done in multiple ways. Uh, this can be done, I love the use of appendix slides. I never tell an entrepreneur to delete a slide ever. That, that slide took time and energy and work, and you never know when it might work good for you or for that particular investor that asked that certain question. Your question session of your presentation is a part of your entire pitch. And I think individuals lose sight of that sometimes. They're like, oh, I only have five minutes to pitch or I only have seven minutes to pitch. Well, for our deal screening, you actually have 14 minutes up in front of the investors. And you can be strategic about how you use those 14 minutes. Use those appendix slides. Don't take down your pitch deck. Be ready and prepared. The more ready and prepared you are, the more we know that you have actually looked through and, and thought out and have seen these questions before. So it's really it's good ways, even through Zoom, to demonstrate competency and how you work and operate. And lastly, if you're able to do those things, you will be successful to build relationships and raise capital. We've seen it happen again and again and again. So um, getting through the nitty gritty of the slide deck. Now, please don't take this literally because nothing is actually literal in the entrepreneurial space. There's a lot of gray area that always exists, but this is the general format of what I see works. Uh, and there can be more slides in here. You can go through your slides as quickly as you would like, just as long as it fits within that time frame that you're pitching, whether it be 90 seconds or 10 minutes. Uh, so just pull in what you think is most important uh, for that audience. Uh, but keep in mind, these slides build. Each slide builds on the next slide. It's meant to be like a really good, a script that you've read or a movie series that you've seen. I like to think of Game of Thrones and the character development uh, that occurs throughout the different seasons. Each one builds on the next. And the most important slides are left for the end. And there's a reason for that. And it's because we have the attention span of gnats. We can thank Apple for that. We all have ADD now, uh, especially with all the time that we sit on computers. But we're going to go through each one of these. You do, I have the traction slide at the end. You can exchange that with summary. I like to call out all the good stuff. I think that's traction. Uh, so that's what I call it. But this is really what I think um, creates a deck that's easy to follow. The other thing I want to cue you into is that we have the ability to sort of multitask, but we do not have the ability to multifocus as humans. So it's why we can't text and drive at the same time. It's why you can't listen to two conversations at the same time. So keeping in mind that if you think your pitch and your slide order is fun and interesting and different, it might actually be deterring away 
from your, your goals that you're looking to achieve because the slides aren't coming in an order that the investors used to seeing it. So then I start problem solving in my mind. Well, what's the market? How big is the market? Who are they selling to? And why are they selling to that? As you're talking about, you know, your deal up front. And I'm like, what is this company? I'm not listening to you talk. I'm thinking. And so keeping that in mind, you know, the whole goal of this is to keep the investor as focused as possible on what you're saying throughout the pitch and not trying to problem solve in their head what's going on. All right, well, let's get into the nitty gritty here. So we're gonna start off with our title slide. This is really important. This sets the foundation for everything we're about to hear. So I don't need a lot up front. I just need to know who you are, what your company is, a quick little tagline of what your company does, even if it's like, I'm a B2B SaaS play. Great. Now I know your software is a service and you're selling business to business. Super. Uh, and how much capital are you raising? Why are you standing in front of me today? I'm here raising, you know, a million dollars uh, for my seed round, price round, million dollars. You know, don't talk about pre-money. Don't get into details. Don't, this is 50,000 foot overview but it sets the foundation for everything I'm about to hear. So even if you're not clear through the rest of your pitch, I'm gonna know who you are, what your company is, and at the fundamental level, what you do. Next, problem slide. All right, so first of all, I, I wanna just have you focus on the picture that's here for a minute. When you see this picture, what happens to you? Do you, do you feel a reaction? Can you feel her frustration? Can you see that she's just done? This is what you want to emulate throughout your entire pitch with the types of pictures you choose. So we can thank Apple for the fact that we now think in pictures and have the attention span of gnats. Um, but this problem slide is, is really indicative to really how the rest of the pictures should move throughout your slide. Pictures are important. Colors are important. Logos are important. We, we have an emotional tie to logos and brand value. So keeping that in mind, less words. Uh, if you want me reading your deck, once again, uh, I'm going to be reading your deck and not listening to you talk. So there's different decks you can have. If you have a deck that you want to send to investors that they read that you're not pitching to, great, have that. But for purposes of pitching to a group, as little words as possible. We want to listen to what you say. And usually there's an executive summary that complements all the details that you really want investors to go through. So the other thing about the problem that I want to just cue you into is this is the entrepreneur's most favorite slide to talk about. And I usually, when I start coaching companies uh, who are coming through our forums, two minutes, how much time that they spend talking about the problem on average. I don't care about the problem. I care that there is a problem. I care that you're not a solution searching for a problem. It's important to talk about what the problem and the pain point is in the marketplace. But this slide should really be no more than 30 seconds. So it's, uh, you wanna let me know that the problem exists. You wanna emotionally tie me in to what you're about to present. And just tell me quickly what the pain point is in the market and what's going on. Then we get to the fun part, the solution. Why your solution is better than what currently exists out there in the marketplace. So this can usually be a couple of slides. I would encourage it to be more than one slide uh, because your solution should be a little bit more complex. You can walk us through what it is, how it works, why people are going to choose your solution over what's currently out there in the marketplace. Uh, but how does this really solve that problem that exists? And so have some fun here. Show some fun, happy pictures. Uh, really, once again, tying us emotionally into why your solution is better than what currently exists and why this solution is going to be able to gain the traction to really deliver an ROI to investors down the road. And from the solution, we then go into addressable market. And I really need to add a little red flag uh, to this slide. This is a red flag slide for me. So 
an entrepreneur can really lose me in a pitch and I will become completely disinterested in the company depending on how they address the market. Uh, it's, I have a couple of them. For me, this slide is super important because it shows me that you have methodically thought about how you scale this company. And it also for me ties directly to the financial projections. And that's just how it works for me. Uh, so you know what your total addressable market is. I love pie charts here. I think pie charts are great. Using some sort of graphic is really important uh, to really break it down. But what is the total market opportunity? And then break it down into the different markets that also exist and then pull out that little piece of the pie of this is my target market. And so as you do that, I can see Okay, little startup company, if you tell me your customer is everybody in the world, I will automatically dismiss you. It's, it's, it, I don't care what your product is at that point. You have not thought about how you grow or scale this business in a reasonable fashion. You are a startup company. You are small. You know, there's big behemoths out there. You've got to start someplace. So what is that target market? Is it a geographic? Is it a demographic? How does it work? How do you go out and get them? Stay focused. Bring me big picture down to hyper focused. And then as you bring me into hyper focused, I'm going to then understand how your go to market works. So, taking that little target, you can then tell me a little bit more if your product's complete. Are you just in MVP mode? Where are you at in your product development? Whatever it might be technology, medical devices, a consumer good. Uh, and then talk about the market research and keep referring back to that target market. Uh, the market research, the feedback that you've received from them, uh, why they're looking to buy, why this works. Uh, and then going into the cost of goods sold. You know, how does that work? What are your margins? How are you making money? Who are your current customers? What is that traction? Show me logos. Once again, those, are, those logos, especially if they're logos that I'm going to identify with, uh, are going to tie me emotionally to what you're doing because I'll see the traction there. Oh, wow. You know, they're selling to REI and Microsoft and whoever. I, those are logos that I identify with and mean something to me. So show me that, but then also show me your pipeline. Keep in mind, pipeline's a little different. And so if you are in the early stages of gaining traction, let's say you're pre-seed or even seed, uh, and you are growing your pipeline, that's great. But it will tie into your valuation later. Having a robust pipeline does not give you a high valuation. Um, until it's signed on the dotted line, nothing is realized. So pipeline is great, knowing different verticals you can go in, what that strategy in is good. Uh, but just keep in mind for later on uh, for the deal terms, it doesn't automatically, pipeline doesn't convert into uh, value. Uh, the current customers, current revenue you have is where that comes in. Uh, then what's your plan to grow? So are you moving into different verticals? Are you moving into different geographies? How does that work? And what's your sales strategy? Are you going to be building a sales team? If you are, uh, what are, who are the people on your team that have that sales team experience, can motivate people and really get it done? Or are you going to be marketing on Facebook? Whatever it is, Talk to me about your sales strategy and how you get into the marketplace and grow your revenue. If you're currently in the marketplace, how you're going to scale that revenue up and scale up those customers. These should be two to three slides, in all honesty. It's a lot to cover, but I will say this is the most important part of your pitch for you here because this is what we are funding as investors. So we are funding typically that go-to-market money. And that's what the capital you're raising is going to be used for. So do not skimp on this area of the pitch deck. Uh, it's important. Next, we go into barriers to entry. What is your moat? What protects you? Now, I don't need a lot of time on this slide. I guarantee you, IP, trade secrets, moat automatically will be asked in Q&A. Someone is going to ask you, about your, protect, your, your barriers to entry and your protection. So what I would love here is that you just quickly touch on it, right? I don't need a lot. 
There doesn't need to be a lot of time spent on this slide. You can always come back to it in Q&A and then dive more into the weeds when you're not constrained by getting to the deal or the team or the other slides that you need to get through in your presentation. Know that this is one of the common questions. I mean, I can't, I can't remember a time I didn't sit in a room and someone's like, well, what's going to stop Amazon or Microsoft from going and building that? right? It always happens. So um, just have it in here. It's great to be able to refer to, uh, but your moat's really important and it's your competitive advantage and what sets you apart, which then moves us into competition. And I just, I love this slide and Amber always smiles because I always say that, uh, but it's a great slide. You know, the the person, you can see the emotion from the competition, you know, going after uh, one another here. And the thing is, is when I was an entrepreneur, I was afraid of competition. I, I, I also had a business that had no barriers to entry. And so I think I had some reasons to be afraid because it was really a land grab opportunity I was going after. Uh, but the thing is, there's so much that can be learned from competition. It's awesome. There's differentiation. You can learn from their mistakes. Uh, they can buy you. Uh, there's so much good that comes from a competitive marketplace. It's what makes our markets work. It's what holds businesses accountable to one another. So this slide, really, I encourage you to use pictures as well. Uh, I love quadrant slides. You end up in the upper right-hand corner for a reason. It's not just because, uh, you know, it's supposed to end there. There's actually biology that plays into it more than anything. Our eyes track from left to right. And so where our eyes naturally finish is up in that upper right-hand corner when we're looking at slides. Uh, so that's why that's where your logo ends. So whatever your uh, different metrics that you're measuring, whether it be price and value or quality uh, and price, or just you know keep that in mind, have that quadrant slide, have you there up in the upper right-hand corner. And then, you know, put your logo, the logos of the other businesses throughout uh, those other areas. Uh, you can also do charts and charts do work sometimes, uh, especially if there's certain things that you do better than your competition and you want to identify that. One common practice I see entrepreneurs fall in the trap of is they put themselves at the bottom. Don't ever put yourself at the bottom of the list. It just doesn't look very good. Uh, it looks like you're, you're not going to be able to get up above where your competition is. So make sure you're always at the top of the list. And then once again, keeping in mind that colors are really important as to how we interpret uh, slides and information. So having green checks and red X's uh, means something versus just keeping it with your color scheme. I understand that that works well sometimes from a branding perspective. Uh, but, you know, something to keep in mind and don't have it be too. not break it down because if it turns into an eye chart and we're squinting and trying to read the slide, once again, we're not listening to you talk. Uh, we're trying to, you know, take in the information that you're presenting to us. So that's why I like the quadrant slide approach, keeping it clean, logos, and then also talk about status quo. I feel like a lot of the time entrepreneurs are like, well, there's no competition in my space. I am super niche right here. And it's like, yeah, well, there's status quo uh, that currently exists. And breaking human behavior is hard. Uh, it's amazing that change is the one thing that is most constant in our universe, yet it's the one thing we are most resistant to. So how are you going to break those barriers of change? And, and so call that out because investors will call upon uh, standard practices as well when it comes to your competition. All right, so now we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty of it. As we go through this, you'll see that a crux of my presentation also ends on the last slides. There's reasons for that. All right, so we get to financial projections. Once again, these financial projections tie right back into your market. I methodically know, I thought you know how you thought about how you grow your company, how you bring on each of those customers, how you move into those verticals, your pricing model, how all of that works. This is what financial projections are for. Yes, we know that they are projections. We know that. That's why they're called financial projections. We know they don't need to be exact. Um, what we don't want them to be, 
know is conservative. Uh, if you think about it, and now just think about yourself for a minute as you take in information, there's a lot of different adjectives you can use out there in the world, and they really tell you nothing. They just amplify whatever you're trying to speak to in a certain way or another. But there's no actual concrete information that's tied to it. So when you tell me you have conservative financial projections, what does that mean? What does that exactly mean? Uh, and it's like fingernails on a chalkboard for me. How much of the market is it? How much of an adoption rate is it? Just give me that. This repre that represents these financial projections represent if we are able to obtain 5% of the market. Awesome. I now know exactly what you're talking about. So don't try and use weasel words and words that you think sound great when they actually don't provide me the information I need as an investor to really understand what you're speaking to. Also, uh, you know, just use the real numbers. I just, I can't, it's, it's really hard for me with financial projections where I just, it, it, it's all a bunch of wishy-washy stuff. It just doesn't make sense. So once again, it ties back to that market slide. It shows me growth. Now, if you start calculating your financial projections and you're not getting that hockey stick, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't need to inflate your numbers uh, <laughs> as you go through this. Uh, but if you're not getting that hockey stick growth and that real big inflection that's going to deliver an ROI to the investors, maybe you shouldn't actually be going after venture cash at all. There's lots of different types of businesses that exist out there. And making sure that you're doing the best for what your business is and being able to provide a return is really important. We understand these are risky businesses um, and, and we like taking those risks betting on people uh, we've been doing it for a long time but that said you know hold on to your business as long as you can and until you get to those proper inflection points and then when you get to that point you know then make the decision to really start capital raising if you have to capital raise from the get-go um there's challenges that can come with that and we can get into that more in deal structure. So also on uh, financial projections, use of funds is really important. So you just got done explaining to me all about your go-to-market strategy. Now, you know, break it down in a nice graph on how those funds are going to be allocated. What are my dollars going to be going towards? If I see that all of my dollars are going towards paying your salaries, there's going to be a problem there. Uh, that's going to be a red flag for investors. So please, um, you know, we, we certainly want our entrepreneurs to make a living wage, but we also want our money going to that growth uh, capital and uh, being able to, to really grow and get that business to the next inflection point. All right, from financial projections, uh, we then move into the team because the team is who is executing the financials and really executing the business. And that's the reason why I have the team come here. And this slide, so just like the entrepreneurs skip over or uh, take two minutes uh, talking about their problem, they typically skip over the team slide because they spent too much time on the problem. And so as their time has been allocated, they realize they're running out of time and they need to get to the deal. And so they're like, oh, this is my team. It's great. It's awesome. Skip. Here's my deal. Please don't do that. Uh, I, I can, I'm going to say it one more time. Please don't skip over the team slide. So we are investing in you. You execute the business. Your failure to execute will lead my investment to zero. So the team is essential to everything that's happening. Uh, we need to know who the members of your team are, why they're there, what skill sets they have, what backgrounds they have. And, and once again, using nice pictures, having nice smiling faces of the team, you're able to draw us in a bit to who the team is, name, title, but also if they have logos that are relevant to their previous working experience, please use those. Add those logos in. Once again, those logos emotionally tie us into what is happening. Uh, so, and then how you build your team, because you're going to be great at certain things as a CEO, but what, what are the other skill sets that come in uh, with those other team members that really complement it and build it out? Also, experience is important. 
Uh, who's, who on your team has done this before? Uh, it's a marathon. It's hard stuff building a business. It is not for the faint of heart. And if you are, if your team is green, uh, which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that either, but have a good set of advisors. And these are individuals who have really been there in the trenches and done that and executed and been successful uh, to be able to help support you in this journey. You can call on and that you can trust and ask those hard questions to when things aren't going so good. Uh, they're there to support the business. On the flip side, once you start really bringing in capital, you need to start thinking about a board of directors. Uh, the board of directors is there to assure uh, the fiduciary responsibility to the investors. And it really, especially as you get into later stages, keep your meeting minutes, uh, be, be methodic about how you meet with the board. I know in the early stages it's tough, uh, but as you start bringing in cash, build that in. Uh, Brad Feld uh, wrote a great book on startup boards. I do recommend you read through it on how to build a startup board and what that looks like and how it can support you. But the investors who might be coming into the deal later on are going to feel substantially more comfortable knowing that there's a board of directors there helping to make sure that their investment is, is safe. So really keeping in mind that there's two different types of players with your boards, the advisory board and the board of directors uh, that help support the company in different ways. And there's a lot of experience that you can bring into uh, both of those boards to really support and elevate the team, um, whether you're a, a three-time CEO or you're, uh, it's your first rodeo and you're, and you're going after it and going and getting it. Uh, another thing I want to cue you into here is to be very mindful of who you choose to be on your board of advisors and board of directors. Uh, we love attorneys, sort of. They're great for certain things, kind of. Uh, they should not be an advisor. I'm just going to say that very bluntly. Uh, as same with CPAs. Uh, they are inherently trained to be risk adverse. That is what is in their in their bones. I mean, you, you, you obviously have outliers and things that do exist, but for the most part, they are trained to be risk adverse. And what you are doing is inherently risky. So keeping that in mind that they're great, they work for you. You don't work for them. So um, also keeping that in mind as you uh, continue to build out your advisory board. So I would really seek those serial entrepreneurs, those people who have been there, done that, uh, those serial investors who have been in the trenches uh, for the board of director positions uh, that you have coming into your company to really help support and elevate uh, the team. But spend some time here. If you want to put the advisory board and the board of directions in the appendix because you don't have enough time, that's fine. Uh, someone will probably ask about your team in Q&A. You can always bring up uh, the different boards that you have supporting the, the company uh, and the venture uh, to be able to provide more information during the full uh, Q&A portion of the meeting. All right, down from team to deal. So we had the deal comes next because we're investing in the team. So the, it, the slides here at the end are very important in the order for a reason uh, and how the story flows. So we're investing in the team to go execute. So the first question you need to ask yourself is, is, is my paperwork done? Do I know what my deal terms are? Do I know what's going to work for me at this stage? If it's not, um, you should probably go get that done. Uh, I'm not going to write you a personal check. Uh, to, invest in, to invest in your company. I need to invest into a company and that cannot be done until the paperwork is complete. So next, what are your deal terms? Have you read the contract? Do you fully understand how the investor is affected and how you are affected by these deal terms? And I think a lot of the time what we see is that entrepreneurs trust their attorney to draft the documents uh, and they don't read them. They don't actually understand what they are. They look at the valuation. They make sure that's done. Check. Uh, they look at, you know, maybe maturity date, a few different things. Please read through your contract and ask a lot of questions. What we really like to see, and we just came off of term sheets this last month through our, uh, our cycle and talking a lot about this, is really fair and balanced deals. Uh, this is like a marriage where investors are coming into the opportunity. And so, 
Uh, you're going to be stuck with them a long time and they're going to be stuck with you. So one, making sure that they're the right investors is important. And two, making sure that it's not lopsided one way or the other is also really important. Uh, if you're, what is your strategy for building out your capitalization plan? And how does that play into your deal terms? Uh, are you going after a safe note or a convertible note or equity? Uh, this is where things can get a little sticky. And, you know, Howard Lubert, our uh, Mid-Atlantic chapter president, said this during our meetings this last month, is your term sheet is your greatest marketing tool. And it's true. It is. People buy into good terms. If you, and, and let me just get into this. I'm going to explain it in forms of real estate. I never thought I would use my previous life uh, career to be able to talk about venture capital, but I do for the deal. Um, so it, for equity and this how an investor thinks about it. If you've ever gone searching for a house and you're looking at a house, they're a little bit more pricey sometimes, but there's value there because there's land. And so inherently you are more secure in your investment because if the house burns down, you still have value in the land and the land is there. Uh, and that's really what equity is. Equity ties us directly into the deal. We are brought in right from the get-go. We have shares. We are bought into the success of this opportunity uh, and we're excited about it. And now you have these cheerleaders for you, helping you along the way who are now tied directly to the success of your business. We have convertible notes. Now that typically, uh, there's maturity dates, there's, there's interest, there can be a discount uh, that can be used uh, with, with notes uh, to be able to sweeten the pot. They're typically meant to be bridges. They're, they're meant to be a bridge between two equity financing rounds. So you've got your milestones that you set out to hit with your first equity financing round, but you're not quite there yet. You just need 500,000 more to really get you over that, that edge point, right? To be able to get you that next valuation inflection point for your series A, let's just say. And so you just need that little bit of extra influx of cash that investors come in on a convertible note and moving into your equity, which would happen, you know, in a shorter amount of time that is determined. I call this a condo with a view. So I'm not actually fully bought into anything. It's air. I buy air, but I have a view. So if, if the market does tank, I'm a little bit more secure in my investment than I otherwise would be because I have this beautiful view protecting me uh, from what that might be. And then there's safe notes. Uh, safe notes are a simple agreement for future equity uh, built out of Y Combinator. Uh, they're, they are more standardized than convertible notes. Convertible notes can be dime a dozen, and we could get into all sorts of deal term uh, items on convertible notes that you really need to look to and ask questions of your attorneys. But safe notes, I call the, the ground floor uh, condo conversion. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of upside for me as an investor. Uh, there's, there's a lot of upside for you as the entrepreneur. That's great. Uh, but there's really, there's no, there, there's a qualified event that needs to occur to, to, to exercise that into equity. But if that qualified event doesn't occur, guess what? I'm just like floating out in no man's land, uh, you know, might have equity one day if the company's able to do something, maybe if I'm lucky. Uh, and so I have yet to really speak to an investor that likes safe notes, uh, just to QUN. you uh, in. And this is investors across the country. Actually, one of our investors up in Vancouver, BC is trying to figure out a way to do away with safe notes and make them a little bit more like convertible notes, but standardized. Uh, so we do like the standardized piece of it because we know what's in there, similar to equity documents, uh, but they're cheap, they're fast. It can be a great way to bring money in quickly. Uh, if you wanna just bring in a few extra dollars before you're going into a price round, uh, but be strategic about that and how you use them and know your audience and know the pushback you're going to get. So if you are raising on a safe note, it's fine. You can choose to do what you want, uh, but be sure to be able to have those hard answers of ready to go when, they, when the investors start asking you about your deal terms and what they could be. So I'm thinking about this once again as being your greatest marketing tool because you are selling your company. You're selling, you're selling your company to us, the investors, and you're trying to entice us to come in. Uh, you know, what is the best, best path for you to go forward to bring that capital in the door quickly? 
because deal terms matter on how quickly you're able to bring that cash in. And this brings us to valuation. And so valuation is just one of the deal terms, uh, but probably the most forward deal term we talk to often. Uh, because it's the price of the company. Now, I see this often out of the valley that uh, you'll have some sort of company, you won't have revenue, maybe it's a hard, I had, this is real, I had a hardware company, no revenue, no prototype built, $10 million safe note cap. And it's like hard pass, why would I invest in that? Like hardware is hard, one. Uh, two, you have no revenue, you have no customers, you have no product. What makes you worth $10 million? Really? Like what makes you worth that? So think about it once again, going back to real estate. There's this house. It's in a great neighborhood. It's a beautiful home. And you're looking at it and you're like, wow, look at the price on that house now. And then you look at how long it's been sitting on the market and you're like, oh, it's been on the market like six to eight months and houses in this neighborhood sell in like a week. What's wrong with that house? There's got to be something wrong with that house. The foundation, the neighbors, the sewer line. There, it, it, it's got to have some major, major issues. That's the reason why it's been on the market so long. Well, a lot of the time, they just overpriced the house to begin with. And so because they overpriced the house to begin with, the house sits there and no one buys it because the market did not determine its value. And what ends up happening is the homeowner ends up selling the house for substantially less than what the house is actually worth because they didn't price it right to begin with. Now, valuation is complicated and it can be calculated in a multitude of ways. Um, but understanding that what a person is willing to pay is really the price of, your, <laughs> of the company. We had a company come through us this last month and initially at deal screening, they said they, they were, they were going to raise on a note with a 10 million cap and we ran the numbers and ran through things and we came down to 4 million and then, you know, and, and they've been able to close out their round in, in a couple of weeks uh, because they brought their valuation down and people saw that as a realistic valuation with the traction they were at. So being very realistic about your valuation is important. Once again, also getting back to that capitalization plan, not only looking at deals and structures, but where you need to be and what those valuation inflection points are is really, really important. Uh, because if you get out in front too, too far, too fast, and then you don't meet those milestones, the next thing that happens, if you have to bring in more capital and you didn't meet those milestones is a down round. And so that's not a fun conversation to have with the investors that you're about to bring in, uh, the current investors that you have that, oh, I need to ra raise a round less than what you put money in at. Uh, those aren't fun conversations. So understanding really what the whole capitalization strategy is, being realistic about it, understanding that you wanna get back to doing what you do best, which is building your company and not be fundraising and building your company and probably wearing a couple other hats at the same time. So what is the best path forward to be able to do that? quickly and efficiently. Because really, once that traction starts picking up, you start bringing in those customers, you start really providing that value, your valuation will go up. And when you start figuring out the numbers with the capitalization of the company and looking at the cap table, usually it's very minimal implications to you, whether you're raising at a 10 million or you're raising at a six in terms of percents. So just keep in mind in terms of equity in the company and, and ownership that it's all math and it can be figured out, uh, but really being strategic about this. Your deal is really important. Be descriptive in the slide. You can talk about pre-money valuation. If there's a lot of baggage with the company and let's say you're, you're raising another note, but you had four notes prior to that and a couple of safe notes as well, uh, it's gonna make for a messy cap table uh, and trying to calculate what that waterfall is and what the ownership is. And so having some answers uh, to that just available and ready for Q&A is going to be important, as well as just those deep dive investor talks on what that potential post money could look like. Because the post money is actually what matters at the end of the day, not the pre-money. It's what the money is that comes in after the company has got done raising. So uh, please just uh, think about that as you move through deal terms. And then from deal terms, we invest in this great team. They, 
they they tell us their deal and we love it and now we want to know how we make our money back what's that going to look like how are you going to make your money back how are you going to you know be rewarded for years of hard work what does that look like for you what's your exit strategy now there's really not a wrong answer when it comes to the exit strategy the only thing i would really say that could be wrong is not being clear and so if you don't really know how you're going to exit that's a problem uh so really define your exit strategy from the beginning so from the moment you start your company having a path you're working on is important just building to build is great, uh, but what's what's the ROI at the end? If you're gonna bring in investors, uh, and this is not something that you wanna run just forever, uh, what does that look like for you? And, and being clear about it, who ties back to your team? Who on your advisory board? Who on your board of directors? Who in your team has had uh, connections with those individuals? Also, relationships are really key when it comes to exit. And you can think about it as little seeds that get planted along the way. Uh, exit is just another stage of growth in the company life cycle. And I think this gets lost a lot of the time, just like ideation and R&D and, and you know, go to market and then your growth stage. Exit is another stage of the company life cycle and it takes time. So if you get that call in the middle of the night and it's and it's like, hey, I want to buy you. I'm Google, I want to buy you. And you think, this is great. Probably not. Uh, one buyer is no buyer. You have no negotiating power or leverage. So who are those individuals in those relationships that you can plant seeds to along the whole trajectory of your company? And, and even potentially offer some advisory shares. Tie them directly to the success of your business if they are if their company could be a potential buyer. They now win when you win. And so these are really key things to be strategic about the whole way through. So if you haven't, if you've been building your company and you haven't thought about exit, I would really encourage you to come back to that and think about what's in it for you and all the hard work you do. And then also what's in it for those investors that are coming in along the way who believe in you and support you and want to drive this forward. Another thing that you can do that we've seen be helpful in the past is there's a lot of people who work in M&A. There's a lot of individuals uh, who have built and sold companies. Create an exit board of advisors. This is very specific. This is not just the normal advisory work. This is specifically to exit uh, because it's complicated. And because it's complicated, there's a lot of ways things can go sideways and south that you cannot end up realizing your full potential. So these are some things to think about as you think, you know, move towards and talk about your exit slide. On this slide, please include logos, once again, uh, in different verticals, if that's available, and then really be able to tie those back to the people who are on your team, connections you've had, relationships you built, current customers that are in place, whatever that might be, to really emphasize that this is a reality that can occur. The other thing I want to cue you into is every single company for the last 15 years that I have listened to pitch tells me that they're going to exit in three to five years. Every single company tells me they're going to exit in three to five years. Now, I see this maybe 15 to 20% of the time. The rest of the time, I'm in it for the long haul. I know it's going to be probably an eight to 12 year investment, especially now over the last five years. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's have an exit timeline and horizon. Just, just know that you're not unique by uh, saying you're going to exit in three to five years. If you have a more focused plan, if there's a, a more dialed in year that you can speak to that you think you're going to be able to have the revenue and the traction or the clinical trials or whatever it might be at a certain point, maybe be more specific to that. And maybe, you know, 2024, 2025, instead of just saying, I'm going to exit in three to five years. It's just a, it's just a thing we all hear all the time. And the investors kind of roll their eyes after a while. So um, you're not unique there. And then we get to the last slide, which is traction or summary. And this is really all the awesome things that you've done to date. And this is where you tie back into your solution, the traction you have, the customers you have, the sales you have, the IP you have, 
the you know key opinion leaders you have, all you know press acknowledgments, awards, partners, whatever it might be, comes on this slide. Uh, once again, because I have the attention span of the gnat, I have now been just focused on what the deal is and what my exit opportunity is as an investor, and that's really what I'm thinking about. Um, and so it's nice to be reviewed upon. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay, I just got done hearing how I'm going to make my money back. Oh, that's right. They do. They have they have five hundred thousand in revenue right now. This is awesome. Okay, great. They have these great customers. All right. Yeah, that's right. They have. They're about to sign these contracts. Yes. Okay, great. And so that product market fit is there. And these are the things that I'm thinking through in my mind as an investor, as I'm reminded of all of these things, and then press and accolades and awards. Um, you know, the team with however many years of experience combined together. Uh, to be able to execute and get it done. It's just a nice refresher to hear before I, uh, it's just a nice refresher to hear before I fill out my interest poll. And then close. And so in your closing, thank the investors for their time. Once again, have your contact information up here. If you are moving through our process, you're going to, and you're building a due diligence team, let people know you're building a due diligence team. You would love them to come on board and learn more. Uh, please entice them to fill out their interest sheet. Know that, know that you're excited about following up and answering any questions for them. Uh, and, and then, you know, you can once again, take some of those key uh, logos, advertisements, uh, press accolades, awards, and have them here. Uh, logo of the company, nice and big. Uh, so that's really the crux of the um, the presentation and how I think about it. Uh, just some key takeaways I want to go through before I conclude and open it up to questions is just reminding you that once again, your pitch is meant to generate interest. And so if you set goals about how much interest that you want to uh, achieve from each pitch that you make, those are going to be a lot more achievable goals than how many dollars that's going to necessarily equate to, because the dollars are going to really come from those follow-on conversations, building relationships, and how you're able to really close that. And, and they will invest in you. Uh, number two, know your audience and know them before you reach out. Uh, know who funds what at what stages. The investment groups are pretty explicit, especially on their websites about what they fund at different times. So don't just cold blast uh, investors. I know there's a lot of people that tell you to do that. I, I don't think it works very well. Um, so uh, just be just really know your audience. Uh, are your documents done and do you fully understand your deal terms and the implications to the investors that are coming in and the implications to you? Uh, stay out of the weeds. You know, so if you really want to dive into case studies and things like that throughout your pitch, I would say don't. Those are good for Q&A. Someone's going to ask you about customer experience. You can dive into those case studies. You can do things. Really stay focused on the business and how the business is growing. And, you know, keep it high level. You have time to dive into the weeds on those follow-up calls once you've generated your interest. Less words, more pictures. Uh, please don't make investors read slides. What's your capitalization plan? Know it inside and out. This will be asked to you probably in the follow-up calls as we continue to understand the different valuation inflection points and the dilution that we're going to receive, which we expect uh, along the way. But really knowing how you build and grow this company and the plan that you've put in place is important. What's your exit strategy? And be realistic about the timing and what that looks like. And lastly, uh, you don't need to have all the answers. We know that these pitches are not, your company isn't perfect. We know that there's a lot of things that we can help with and we want to help. Uh, so just be coachable. And, and, and that's probably the most important thing that can come through in your pitch than trying to be a know-it-all. And so uh, with that, that is my uh, presentation. I will leave you with this final quote is forget all the reasons it won't work and believe in the one reason it will. So thanks for listening in. With that, I appreciate all of you being on today, letting me share some of my knowledge and wisdom with you. Uh, if you have any further follow-up questions, uh, you can feel free to email me or Amber. I think Amber's been chatting with most of you probably throughout the meeting anyways, and, uh, and I'm happy to do so. So um, thank you all. I wish you a wonderful Friday uh, and a wonderful weekend. And uh, go out there and keep doing the hard fight that you're doing. And uh, we, we appreciate the innovation that you continue to uh, build every single day because our, our world needs it more than ever. Thank you all.